done. And I'm going to start from the beginning and do it the same way I did the last time. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're looking at derivatives of exponential functions this time. And by the way, because it's a regular class, I've not muted anybody. I don't plan on muting anybody. If you have a question, just jump in. We can't all talk at once, but just go ahead and ask your question. And I'll try to answer it as we go along. All right. First part of this is looking at the derivatives of the exponential function e to the power of x. I'll explain what e is, although it's probably something that I mentioned before. Hang on a second. Three people have entered the waiting room for this meeting. Give me a second. Let me see who these people are. All right, Midhat. Amen. Just letting some other people in here. All right, the other person, I still don't know who that is. Okay. <clears throat> First part that I want to talk about is this E, this base E function. As you can see at the top of the screen, you can define a function, an exponential function with a base of E. What is E? E was something that was introduced by, uh, I'm not gonna give you a history lesson, but somebody called Leonard Euler, and you can see the dates here that he was around, Swiss mathematician. He was one of those that popularized pi as a symbol. And he also popularized the use of i to represent imaginary numbers. But he also came up with e, which is a constant, just like pi is a constant, you know, 3.14 or whatever, e is also a constant. And it turns out that if you want to get the value of that constant, you can graph this function here, and I'll show the graph of that in a second. And it's the limit of this function as x approaches infinity. So there's actually uh, like a, like a, uh, as asymptote of the function. And as you get at the end behavior of the function, as you move further and further to the right or to the left, it actually approaches this value e, of e, which is 2.71828, et cetera, et cetera. So just like pi, hold on one second, let me just let some other people in. I have, to, I have to do this as we go along. Sorry about that. All right. So just like pi, um, this is a non-terminating decimal and there is no, it's, a, it's an irrational number. It doesn't have any pattern to it. So what does the graph look like? Here's what the graph looks like. If I were to graph one plus one over x to the x, it looks like this function. So as you can see, it approaches asymptotically as you go to minus infinity and as you go to positive infinity, this value of 2.71828. And that's what E is. So I put on this function, the actual red line is the one plus one over x to the power of x. And I've also put on the function a flat line, a horizontal asymptote of y equals the value of e, which as you can see here is a 2.71828. So that's all that is. All right. I'll tell you a function that I was fascinated with when I was a student. I came up with this, and we'll go into this in another class. If you were to graph the function x to the power of one of x, so the x root of x, it turns out the function looks like what you're seeing on the screen and the function reaches its maximum at the same value of e. And I couldn't figure out, you know, when I was in calculus as a, as a, as a youth back in the day, I couldn't figure out why it was that the function reaches its maximum at the value of e. I've since been able to come up with something and I can show that to you in another class. But this maximum point of the function x to the power of one over x. So in other words, if I took the derivative of this and set it equal to zero, then this value is the value that would make it equal to zero, the e, the value of e. All right, you know, you all would have in advanced functions learned about the exponential function. So any base could be raised to an x, to, to, to a variable. So for instance, two to the power of x, three to the power of x, those are all exponential functions. And we also learned back in advanced functions that the inverse of an exponential function is a log function. So what I want to do is spend a few minutes reminding you about exponential functions and log functions because they're both, just give me a second here. Uh, hold on. I'm just trying to let in the person who was, who was um, in the waiting room. Anyway, so the, there's a link between an exponential function and a log function, and they are both inverses of each other. So we can actually have an exponential function which has a base of e in it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of remind you what log functions and exponential functions look like. So if I had the base 3 log of 81, this is how it would look with a subscript of 3 of 81, and if I asked you to evaluate this, does anybody, first of all, know what the answer to this is and how we could actually figure out the base log without a calculator, by the way? What's the base three log of 81? Anybody? Four. 
Okay, good. And here's one way that you can do that. First of all, set it equal to X. You don't know what X is. And then put this, what's a log format into an exponential format. What is this log statement as an exponential statement? How would I write this in exponential form? So log base three of 81 is equal to X. What is that in exponential form? Three to the power of X equals 81. Absolutely. So in that form, if I gave this to you most, all, I think all of you would be able to come up with the answer that X was equal to four, right? So that's just using a base three system. What if I ask you for the base E log of four, what does that mean? It means exactly the same thing, right? It means that if I set that equal to X, then e to the power of x is equal to four. But unfortunately, you don't know, using this strange 2.71828 thing that we just talked about, what do I raise that to to get four? That probably doesn't mean anything to you right now. But one of the things you need to recognize is that on your calculator, if you have your calculator nearby, there is a key on your calculator that looks like this. It says LN, it's called the natural log. Sometimes they say lawn, in this case, lawn four. So when I ask for the base E log of four, I'm asking for the lawn of four. So if you hit the lawn key on your calculator with the four, you'll get this value. So the lawn of four is equal to whatever this number is approximately. I mean, I'm just using an approximate value here because again, it's an irrational number. So it's gonna go on forever. So if I ask for the base E log of four, I'm still asking the same question, which is the lawn of four, and it really looks the same as what we did with the first question over here. Sorry, the first question over here. I can say that since e to the power of this number is equal to four. So, oh, sorry, let me go back there a second here. Since this, since, since this is a lawn of four, then e to the power of this would be approximately equal to four, just as you, just as you have it over here, right? So I'm just trying to make the link between logs and exponents and also the what the, what, when the base is E, what does that, what is, what exactly does that mean? All right, so let's just move on. If you remember the graphs of log functions and exponential functions, you would recognize that this is an exponential function. And I've drawn the one of E to the power of X in black. And you'll notice, of course, that all exponential functions, if they don't have an initial value or some, you know, like, a vertical translation or something, they all go through one. So that's what the y-intercept is on all exponential functions, regardless of what the base is. So the base of E doesn't change that. So it's an exponential function that is asymptotic to the x-axis. It goes up through one and then it rises like that. If I were to put in the y equals x line, remember from advanced functions, then reflecting across that line gives us the inverse function. So this inverse function here is the lawn function, the natural log of x. So if this is the e to the x, then this is the lawn of x, the inverse of the e to the x function. And that's what the graph looks like. Again, just remember that if this has a y-intercept of one, this would have an x-intercept of one because the log of one in any base is zero. So if you take the log in, in the base e of one, the answer is still zero as it is for any other um, function, any other base rather. All right, so that hopefully sort of brings you back a little bit to the stuff that we did with logs and exponents in the advanced functions course and also introduces you to the concept of E as a special base that you can have for exponential functions. Now, let's look at the derivative of the E to the X function. I'm gonna start this little video. Right now, what you're looking at is F of X equals, this is a Desmos video I'm about to show you. This is the function f of x equals e to the x. So there is your exponential function going through one, as we said. And then you probably notice already, Desmos can draw the derivative function. So the second one, which I haven't um, highlighted yet, is gonna represent the derivative function of x. So f of x is e to the x. When I press this button, it will now show me what the derivative function looks like. So we talked about the exponential function looking like that, which it does. So here comes a video. No sound, let's just watch what happens you notice that that represents the e to the x. And now I'm gonna go ahead and show you what the derivative function is. Okay, it just came up on the screen and I'm taking off the original function. So there is a derivative function. What is that telling you? I just put the both of them on the same graph. So what's the derivative of e to the x then? Anybody? 
I just shown you the e to the x function and the derivative of e to the x function. So is it just the same thing? That's exactly right. Bottom of the screen. If f of x is e to the x, then miraculously, the derivative function is also e to the x for all real values of x. Okay, we just let in an isha there. All right, so there you go. All right, so this is probably the easiest derivative to remember. If the original function is e to the x, then the derivative function of the e to the x function is e to the x. Okay, let's move on. Let's take our first derivative, y equals e to the 4x. Well, just to remind you how these functions derive, I'm going to break this up into the chain law. Let me remind you that if I'm using the chain law, I can have y equals e to the u. So I'm changing, I let it, I'm letting 4x be u. So I'm gonna call the first function y equals e to the u. Then I'm gonna call u 4x. So what that means is that if I want dy dx, then I'm gonna take dy du and multiply that by du dx. We've done the chain law before, so this should look familiar to you. So what's dy du? What's the derivative of this dy du? Anybody help me out there. What would the, based on what I just told you, if the original function is y equals e to the power of u, what would dy du be? Silence, come on folks, help me out here. What's dy du? If I were to derive this thing with respect to u, dy du, what would dy du be? It's e to the power of u. Should so that e just be e to the power of u then? Because we just said that if you derive e to the power of u, then the derivative of that is e to the power of u. So dy du would be e to the power of u. But du dx, which is the second part of this, if I were to derive this with respect to x, so du with respect to x, that's a very simple one. What's the answer for that? Derive the second part, u equals 4x. How do I derive that? So u equals 4? Yeah, exactly. So the du dx is 4. The dy du is e to the power of u. It doesn't change because that's how you derive e to the power of x. In the, this is e to the power of u, but it's still you know, a, a variable. So all I need to do is just multiply these two together. So here's the derivative. dy dx is e to the power of u times 4, which is if I just resubstitute that u, e to the power of 4x times 4. So that's your derivative. So I just sort of rearranged it a little bit so it looks a little neater. So the derivative of e to the 4x is 4e to the 4x, because what I'm doing is I'm deriving the e to the u and then multiplying that by the derivative of the u itself. So it's really the chain law, right? When you multiply the two derivatives at the end. So does that make sense to everybody? I mean, if it doesn't, we can go over that again, if you're not sure of what I just did. All right, I'm gonna move on. All right, second question x to the power of five, e to the power of minus three x squared. We have to derive this. So what steps do you think we have to go through for this one? Anybody again? Which are the derivatives? Hope you guys, hope you guys haven't forgotten all your derivatives. What is the principle that would apply if I had to derive this function? What are we looking at here? I can't hear anything. Is that a product? Yes, no, is it a product? Yeah, you're right, yes. it's the product law. Exactly. <laughs> Good job, Mr. Kamek. <laughs> exactly. All right, so we're gonna use a product law. So if I'm using a product law, right, I'm multiplying x to the five. And oh, by the way, since I just got agreement on that, did everybody be clear on the, the one I did before? I just want to make sure that the, I didn't lose anybody there. Is everybody okay with that? I hope so. All okay. right, product law. All right, so product law. So I have two things being multiplied, this and this. If the product law holds, then it means I should have this. I should have the first thing derived, which is the 5x4, multiplied by the underived second parts. I'm not deriving that plus I'm gonna derive the e to the minus three x squared now, which means I'm gonna have the e to the minus three x squared multiplied by the derivative of this, like we just did on the previous one, which is minus six x, multiplied by the underived first term, which is the x to the power of five. Let me go through that again. I'm splitting this up into two parts. 
So I'm going to derive the first, which is the 5x4, multiply it by the underived second part, which is this. Then I'm going to derive the e to the minus 3x squared, which is just e to the minus 3x squared, multiplied by the derivative of the minus 3x squared, which is the minus 6x, multiplied by the x to the power of 5. So hopefully that all makes sense. So you think I would allow you to leave it like that? No way. You're going to have to go further. We're going to factor out the common factor. Well, first, before we factor the common factor, I just sort of tidied this up a little bit. I put the minus 6x and the x5 together, which gives me minus 6x to the power of 6. I just combine those two. And then I'm going to factor out the common factor. There's a common factor here of an x to the power of 4 and an e to the minus 3x squared. If you look at that, you can see that there's a common factor between those two. So let's factor that out. So if I factor out the x to the 4 and the e to the minus 3x squared, I end up with this, the 5 minus 6x squared. I don't want to go too quickly so I leave anybody behind, but hopefully you're able to understand the algebra behind what I just did. All right? So there's your derivative. And I do expect you to be able to move from this to this. All right? That's my expectation because many times when you have a derivative and you have to maybe set it equal to zero, if it's in factored form like this, then it helps you to be able to, to solve it. So that's why I went further to actually factor it. And that's what the final derivative is. All right, how about this one? Do I use that product law again, e to the x? We just learned that the product law was what we had to use the first time, e to the x and e to the 4x. What do you think I need to do? Product law again? Yeah. Everybody agrees with product law? Me or somebody else? Or yes, is, there any other, is, there any other, is there any other method? Because I have another method. Can't you combine them? Thank you very much. Don't they have the same base? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what's the result of combining them with the same base? What's the final? This is say I'm not deriving anything yet. I'm just trying to simplify this thing. So if I were to simplify this, what would the result be? E to the power of 5x. As simple as that. As simple as that. So now this looks a lot more like the very first derivative that we had, which is this. It will be just e to the 5x. I'm not doing anything with it. And then multiplying that by the derivative of the exponent, which is the 5. So it's just 5 e to the power of 5x. Don't have to overcomplicate it. Yeah, you could use the product law if you wanted to on this. But why go through all of that when it's so much easier just to combine them into one and then use the chain law to do it? All right, that's so much easier to do. So don't, I, I don't want you to get into sort of a, uh, an impulsive thing where you see a product and decide the only way to deal with it is as a product. Sometimes just simplifying it is easier. Okay, let's do some questions now. These, I think, come from the textbook. And I think I have two of them to go through. We're going to determine the value of the derivative at minus one. So we have the function 3e to the x squared, and we want to find out the value of this function or the derivative at minus 1. So obviously the first thing we have to do is to derive this. Hmm, is this a product law thing again, or what am I doing here? Or just a chain law, or what do you think? What, what, what might this derivative look like? One, folks, I don't want to do all the talking here. Anybody, jump in. What would the first step of this look like? Or should we go back and look at some of the previous ones that we did just to make sure everybody is clear on the earlier steps? What would the derivative of this one look like? Let me give you a piece of advice. If this is just a constant being multiplied by e to the x squared, leave out the constant, right? It's treated like a coefficient. Just derive this part right here and then multiply it by three. That was one of the laws or the principles of derivatives that we learned earlier. So if I could just ask you to derive e to the x squared, how would you do that? Just e to the x squared. How, what, what's the derivative of that? Use the chain law. We'll bring, we'll bring the three into it later on. 2e to the x? Mm, a little bit more than that because we have to take e to the x squared as it is, not do anything with it and then multiply that by the derivative of the exponent, which is x squared, or sorry, 2x. So it should look like this. 
So leave the three. If I, if you, if you just didn't have the three, I, I mean, I have the final answer here, but if I didn't have this six here and I just simply had the three still, then it would be e to the x squared, which is this, be multiplied by two x. So the two x times the three is what gives us the six x. All right. Hopefully that makes sense. Right. You know what? When you're doing the homework, hopefully you are going to do the homework, even though I might not be able to check it, then you should hopefully become more familiar with it. It makes more sense to you. But I'll, I'll go through this again. So 3e e to the x squared, leave the 3 out of it for now, just to be, deal with the e to the x squared. e to the x squared is just simply going to be e to the x squared. You're not doing anything with that. Multiplied by the, ex, the, the exponent part here derived, which is 2x. So it becomes 2x times the 3, which is a 6x, times e to the x squared. So there is your derivative. And all I have to do now is just put the minus one into that. So putting minus one into that gives me six times minus one times e to the minus one squared. This obviously is just going to be one. So that's e to the power of one. And this is just minus six. So my final answer is this. Let me just let Hamza in here. My final answer is that minus six. You know, notice that I am... Um, leaving it as e in my answer. You know, sometimes when you're working with pi, you don't actually evaluate it into decimals. Some of your answers for some of these questions should be multiples of the e. So in this case, it's minus 6e. That's good enough. You don't have to give me a decimal answer. Leave it as minus 6e. And that's what it is this case. So the 6 times minus 1 is minus 6. This is e to the power of 1, which is just e. So minus 6e is the answer for that one. Okay. All right. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Well, so for e, whenever you have like an e and to, to an exponent, so that e is always um like it, like for the derivative for e, it's just always e, right? It doesn't. Yeah. Well, okay. e to the power. Well, let me let me clarify that. If it, if it's an if if it's just e on its own, if this question was just the derivative of e on its own, the answer is zero. Okay, because e on its own is just a constant, but e to the x would be an exponential function. And the derivative of that exponential function, e to the x, would be e to the x. Oh, okay. All Does right. that make sense? But yeah. derivative of e is like the derivative of pi, yeah. which is just zero. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks. All right. Um, let's... Mr. Sure. Mr. Kavik, I have a quick question. So if it was e to the power of x plus 2, would it still be the same thing? Okay, what good question. So let's say it was e to the power of x plus 2. I know I have a whiteboard thing here, but I'm not very good at using a whiteboard because I don't write very well. So just bear with me. If it was e to the power of x plus 2, the answer would be e to the power of x plus 2 multiplied by the derivative of x plus 2, which would just be 1. So it would still be e to the power of x plus 2. Because you still have to derive the top part of that. Does that make sense? Let me yes, say that. That makes, sense. that makes sense. Okay, right. Now, if that had been e to the power of 2x plus 2, then that would be a little different because then you have to multiply by the root of 2x plus 2, which would be 2. So it would be e to the power of 2x plus 2 multiplied by 2. Okay. All right. So I'm going to move on. This is one more question left. Connecting the derivative of an exponential function to the slope of the tangent. So they're asking us now to find the equation of the line which is a tangent to this when x is 2. Okay. That would suggest that we have to have the derivative of this first. So that's our first task. So here is where the product law or the quotient law would make sense. I'm choosing the product law, right? I find product law much easier to work with. So instead of saying this is a quotient of e to the x over x squared, I'm going to call it this e to the x times x to the minus 2. That's just my choice. But if you find it easier to use the quotient law, then by all means use the quotient law. So we have to find this derivative using the product law. All right. So my dy dx now would be the derivative of the first part, which you already agreed would just be e to the x, times the underived second part, plus the derivative of the second part times the underived first part. So here's my answer. Here's my e to the x times x to the minus 2. Here's my derivative of x to the minus 2. So it's minus 2x to the minus 3 multiplied by the underived first part, which is e to the x. Now, any chance I would leave it like that? The answer is no. Give me some ideas as to how I can simplify this a little bit. 
Well, let me, before, before you give me that idea, let me, let me sort of suggest you point you in our direction. What if I were to write it like that? Which is to say, put the x to the minus two as an x squared denominator and the x to the minus three as an x cubed denominator. Still is a minus, it still has the two e to the x on top, but now that would suggest what my next step would be. And that is what? Writing it like this as two fractions would suggest what? Common denominator. Anybody in the room? Nobody? Wouldn't it suggest finding a common denominator, folks? I yes. I think Afra said that too. I'm going to do. <laughs> so my common denominator in this case would be x to the power of three. Hopefully that makes sense. So what do I multiply x squared by to get x to the power of three? That would be x. So it's going to be x times e to the power of x. So that's the first one. And then this one already had a denominator of x to the power of three. So it's going to be minus two x, two e to the power of x. Okay. So now I'm here. Is that good enough? No. What else can I do to simplify this some more? Anything else I can do to simplify this a little bit more? Can you combine the e x and the minus? Come on, I want a little a little participation here, please. Anything Emmett, I can, can do. Can you hear us? It. Hello. Have we been out of the hello? out of the classroom too long? Is that what's going on here? Hello. Hello. Nothing. Emic. No common denominator. Yo. Sorry, common factor that you can think of. <laughs> hello, hello, Mr. He's trolling. He's trolling. He's trolling. Is he's there like, a common like factor? Yo, Kamek. Two terms. <laughs> Kamek, I love you. <laughs> All right, I'm not hearing Yo. anybody, so I'm just gonna go. Ahead. <laughs> common factor, of okay. course, would be Kamek right. style. <laughs> so that's the case. <laughs> I factor that out. I'm left with x minus two. Mm -hmm. And Wait, can everybody this else is what I'm going to use hey, as yo, my derivative. Oh. Yeah, I can I'm hear you guys. Ask, can what hear is us. the equation of the <laughs> tangent line? I'm going to put my guys. Two into hand. this for me to be able to get. Hold on, let me see what's going on here. There's a, some stuff going on in the chat room. Or oh, raise their hands. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't see that. I did not see that. That's not the problem. Uh, <laughs> That's not the problem. Mr. Cameron. No, if you can't hear us, he wouldn't hear you. Yo, Mr. Kevin, you can't hear us, by the way. One of you started, see if he can see you. Hang on a second. He's looking at you. He'll look at you. Oh, oh yeah. yes, I am. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. for a second. <laughs> okay. I am, but you look like Kevin. He's excited. Bro. All right. That's good. All right. All right. Afraz <laughs> and Hadi and everybody, you're raising your hand. Tell me what's up. You want to text me or you want to speak up? Mr. Kevin. Oh, my God, man. Mr. Kamek, hello? What's going on? I don't hear anybody. He can't hear us. He just realized he can't hear. Ayan, oh, what's Ayan, happening? Turn... Talk to me. Ayan, Ayan. <laughs> talk to Ayan. Ayan. <laughs> can, you... can you hear us? I cannot hear you. No, I can hear nobody right now. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you can hear me. We can hear him. We can hear him. Where else? He didn't hear you say that. Oh. I'm going to look at chat. I'm look at chat. I'm okay, look that's at interesting because I'm, I'm not looking at the hearing chat. anybody. I, 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 Kemic, um, Kemic, man. Okay, I'm Portable Wi-Fi not working out. <laughs> look at the chat. All right. <laughs> he's, he's Thanks for all of that. I, I, let me see if I can look at the chat. Spam in the chat. Portable, sp portable mic. Okay, you're not able to hear anyone. <laughs> well, we can, we can hear you, but you can't hear us. Have you muted us, sir? No, I did not mute you. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm not able to hear you. Howdy, man. Chill. Yo, Earth the camera. Uh, no. Oh, so that's why everybody's so silent. Um, I thought he was ignoring our friends. That's so funny. Yeah, that was so funny. I'm sorry about that, folks. He's like, come in and I'm I can unmute everybody at the same time. I don't know if I can do that or not. Okay, man. Yo, imagine on YouTube they cannot like, hear us. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is recording. Oh, my God. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know why I can't hear it, but I'm just going to move on. Okay, sorry about that, folks. I will probably just take questions from you afterwards, all right? Well, let me just continue. Sorry about that. Anyway, so here we go. X equals 2 is the place that we have to figure out what the tangent line is. And if we put 
two into this function, notice that the slope, well, this becomes zero, so the whole thing becomes zero. So when x is equal to two, the slope is zero. All right, so we're asked to find the equation of a tangent line, so I'm gonna move on. The tangent line means I'm gonna to need to find the coordinate at that point of tangency when x is equal to two. So I'm gonna put that two back into the original function and see what I get because I need an X and a Y for me to come up with, a, with, a, with an equation. So if I put two into this, e to the power of two, and X, and when, when X is uh, two, that's gonna give me this. When X is two, I'm gonna get e squared over four. So this is my Y value when X is two. And now, since the slope is zero, I can have the equation on the line because a zero slope and a Y intercept of e squared over four means that my equation is simply y equals e squared over four, and that's it. All right, I'm gonna end this part of it and go back to stop sharing my screen. Give me one second here.